Hi everyone, my name is Howie and I decided to compile my TikTok videos on here. The purpose of my TikTok account is to show that math can be understandable and that math can be fun. So if you want to be up to date on my videos, you can find me on TikTok at Howie underscore wa. That is Howie underscore H-U-A. If you want to, you can comment down below which one of these videos was your favorite. I'm really eager to know, so I hope to hear from you soon and I hope you enjoy these videos. Today, we are going to show an easy visual of what one third plus one ninth plus one twenty seventh plus one over eighty one, etc., approaches to. What you're going to do is you're going to grab the biggest book you can find and you're going to constantly split the pages into thirds. So here's a third and here's a third. And you keep continuing this. So split the remaining part into thirds and then uh, let the pages fall. So now we have a third plus a ninth on each side. Keep splitting into thirds and letting the pages fall. So now we have a third plus a ninth plus a twenty-seventh. And if we had an infinitely big book, we're going to see that each side will approach half of the book. So that means a third plus a ninth plus a twenty-seventh and so forth will approach to half. Here is one way to show why the area formula of a circle is pi r squared. You grab some laughing cow cheese wedges. You rearrange the cheese wedges like this. Notice this side over here is just the radius, and this side over here is just half of the circumference. We know the circumference is 2 pi r, so half of that is just pi r. And if we had infinitely small slices, this approaches a rectangle. And we know a rectangle's area formula is base times height. So base times height over here is just pi r times r, which gets you pi r squared. Here's another way to show why the area formula of a circle is pi r squared. First, grab some hubba bubba bubble tape. Technically, we would want concentric circles, but a spiral will get the point across. Then you are going to make a cut from the edge to the center. After that, you are going to unravel each layer. You're going to get something that looks like this. If we had an infinite amount of layers, we are going to approach a triangle. We know that this side over here is just the radius because we cut until we hit the center. And this side over here is just the circumference, since that is the outer layer. Well, what is the area formula of a triangle? Base times height divided by 2. So in this case, base times height divided by 2 will give us our pi r squared. Let me know in the comments which proof you liked better, the cheese or the gum. Have you ever wondered why pi is roughly 3.14? Well, today we're going to be learning about how Archimedes came up with this approximation over 2200 years ago. Pi is defined as the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. And to find the circumference, Archimedes inscribed and circumscribed polygons on the circle because he knew that the circle's circumference is going to be between those two perimeters. He also knew that if we added more sides to these polygons, we're going to get closer and closer to the actual value of this constant. So not only did he do this for 6 sides, he did this for 12, 24, 48, and 96. And with 96 sides inside and outside of this circle, he came up with this approximation. Hi everyone, today we are going to be learning about how to count in base 2 with your right hand. So, uh, first you write 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16 on your right hand, and the fingers up should add up to your target number. So let's count from 1 to 31. 1, 2, 3, I'm skipping 4 and 5 on purpose, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31. So if you want to write 18 in base 2, that's 16 plus 2. Fingers up mean 1, fingers down mean 0. So 18 in base 2 is 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. Here's my favorite way to multiply by 11. Now with 26 times 11, it ends in a 6. 
2 plus 6 is 8, and it starts with a 2. With 72 times 11 ends in a 2, 7 plus 2 is 9, and it starts with a 7. With 58 times 11, it's a little trickier. Uh, it ends in an 8. 5 plus 8 is 13, so we write it 3 here, and we carry a 1 to the next place value. Would have started with the 5, but we add the 1 to get 6 over here. And we can do this with 3-digit, 4-digit, 5-digit multiplication by 11, so ends in a 4. 3 plus 4 is 7. 2 plus 3 is 5, and it starts with a 2. Now, why does this work? Well, when we multiply like this, we can see that the 1's place always stays the same, and all of the other digits are just added to the digit directly to the right of it. Hi everyone! We are going to look at how difference of squares can make multiplication easier for us. Difference of squares can be rewritten as what's seen on the left. Here are a couple examples to see how we can use this to our advantage. If you know what 20 squared is, and you need to know what 19 times 21 is, it's just one less than that 20 squared. So 20 squared is 400. That means 19 times 21 is 399. If you know that 50 squared is 2500, and you need to know what 49 times 51 is, it's just one less than 2500. So that means 49 times 51 is 2499. Now, if your numbers are two above and below your target number, you just need to subtract four this time. So 18 times 22, that's 400 take away four, that's 396. 48 times 52, subtract four from 2,500, so that is 2,496. Hi everyone, Valentine's Day is coming up, so I would like to share with you how to make these intertwined hearts using Mobius strips. All you need is paper, a pair of scissors, and tape. First, you grab two strips of paper, and then you're going to grab one of them, and you're going to almost connect it, but flip it halfway over like this, and then tape it across. And then for the other one, you're going to do the same thing, except you're going to flip it the other way. And then you're going to tape it all the way across. Now you have two Mobius strips. What you're going to do is you're going to tape them together at a right angle. Now that you taped your Mobius strips together, it's going to look something like this. Make sure you taped all the way across because we are going to now cut through the center of each Mobius strip, including the intersection. And once you're done, you're going to get two intertwined hearts. You don't need to rely on two negatives making a positive in order to do integer subtraction. And here's the secret. Say take away instead of minus. Take away is much more concrete and it tells you exactly what to do. So for example, with negative six, take away negative one, literally take away negative one. So you are left with negative five. What about negative five, take away negative two? Well, just take away negative two and you're left with negative three. But what if you don't have any negatives to take away, like six, take away negative three? Just add three positives and three negatives like this. Now we can take away negative three, so let's do that. And we are left with six, take away negative three is nine. The decimal representation for sevenths is really cool in that you can generate all of these just by knowing that one seventh is 0 0.142857 repeating. All you do is just start at different places and go in increasing order as you go through these. So for example, two sevens, the next digit in increasing order is two, so it's 0 0.285714 repeating. Next digit in increasing order is four, so it's 0 0.428571 repeating. Four sevens, the next digit in order is five, so it's 571428. Five sevenths, the next digit in increasing order is seven, so seven, one, four, two, eight, five. And lastly, six, the last digit in increasing order is eight, so it's eight, five, seven, one, four, two. How do we know that we can flip the second and multiply when we divide fractions? We can show this using two steps. So the first step is just writing it as a complex fraction like this, five, six divided by three fourths. And then you multiply the numerator and the denominator by the reciprocal of the denominator to get rid of it. And we need to multiply the numerator and the denominator by that to multiply by 1 to get something equivalent to what's on the left. 3 fourths times 4 thirds is 1, showing that 5 6 divided by 3 fourths is equivalent to 5 6 times 4 thirds, which is what we wanted to show. 
Now you don't always need to rely on flipping the second and multiplying when dividing fractions. If the numbers are friendly enough, you could just divide across. So for example, four divided by two is two, nine divided by three is three. In school, we were taught that we cannot just add the numerators and add the denominators across, but what happens if we break the rules? For example, we can say one plus two is three and three plus five is eight. One third plus two fifths isn't three eighths, but this approach does give us some sort of result. Whenever we do this, we get something called the fairy mean, and the fairy mean always gives us a fraction in between the two original fractions, given that these two original fractions are different from each other. This means that we can keep doing this over and over and over again to find an infinite amount of fractions in between the two original fractions. So even though it would have been great if fraction addition does work like this, this does give us some sort of result, just not one that we intended. Why doesn't side-side angle work as a triangle congruence? Let's take this for example of a side length of 5 inches, a side length of 11 inches, and an angle of 30 degrees. Here is our 30 degree angle, here is our 11 inch side length, and our goal is to construct a 5 inch side length touching the 11 inch side length. So I centered a circle at the end point of the 11 inch side length with radius 5 inches. As you can see, it touches the projection of the 30 degree angle in two spots, meaning that one student can say, here is my triangle, and another student can say, well, here's my triangle. Obviously, they are different triangles. That is why side-side angle congruence doesn't work as a triangle congruence. But side-side angle does work if the longer side is not touching the given angle because that circle will only touch the projected angle exactly once. Can we multiply decimals without relying on counting the decimal places? The answer is yes. Whether or not there are decimals here doesn't change the digits in the product. It's just a matter of where do we place that decimal. So we can do this through estimation. This is roughly 4 times 9. 4 times 9 is 36. So where should we put the decimal so it's close to 36? Well, between the 0 and the 2, so it's 40.204. Look, we didn't have to rely on moving the decimal point. If you want to know why counting decimal places work, this can be shown by converting these into fractions. As we can see, we are dividing by powers of 10, and there's a strong connection between dividing by powers of 10 and moving decimal places. Can we subtract left to right? The answer is yes. Let's take a look. 5 take away 1 is 4, and 2 take away 8 is negative 6. Now, this isn't 4 take away 6. Keep in mind the place value. This is 40 take away 6, which is 34. You can definitely do this with larger numbers as well, like 2 take away 1 is 1, 3 take away 6 is negative 3, 5 take away 7 is negative 2. Keep in mind your place value, so this is 100 take away 30 take away 2, which is 68. Many of us were taught that there's only one way to approach a problem. For example, we can only subtract right to left. But when I learned this strategy from James Tanton a couple years ago, it made me realize that we need to constantly ask ourselves what if, try it out, and see if it works to show that math is much more creative than what we were taught. Here's a way to score numbers ending in 5 in your head and why it works. It's two steps. Always ends in 25, and you look at the number other than the last 5 and multiply it by the next number up. For example, 35 squared, 3 times 4 is 12, ends in 25. 65 squared, 6 times 7 is 42, ends in 25. 10 times 11 is 110, ends in 25. Now, why does this work? Squaring numbers that end in 5 can be written in this form right here, and when we distribute, we get 100n squared plus 100n plus 25. Both of the first two terms have 100n in common, so we factor that out. Rewriting, we get n times n plus 1 times 100 plus 25. That n times n plus 1, that's where that 3 times 4, 6 times 7, 10 times 11 comes from, ending in the hundreds place, and that's why we always end in 25. Why do perpendicular lines have slopes that are opposite reciprocals of each other? The answer comes down to congruent right triangles. In Euclidean geometry, the interior angle sum of any triangle is 180 degrees, so if we have a right angle, that means A plus B has to add up to 90 degrees. So let's create two lines that are perpendicular to each other, knowing this information. So let's create a line like this, and let's create a line like this, and let's find their slopes. The slope of the first line is m over n, and the slope of this other line is negative n over m. And look, we have opposite reciprocals. 
Let's talk about the hairy ball theorem. Imagine that you're given a task where you need to comb the surface of a hairy ball until it is completely smooth. Well, the hairy ball theorem says that this is impossible, that there's going to be at least one hair that's going to stick straight out. Now, what makes the hairy ball theorem so interesting? Well, there's real world applications such as wind on Earth. So imagine each strand of hair as a vector of wind. The hairy ball theorem states that at any given time, there exists a point on Earth where there's no wind, such as the eye of a hurricane. One of my favorite connections between math and music is that the frequency of notes of common intervals have nice ratios. For example, the notes in an octave make a 2 to 1 ratio. Perfect fifths have a 3 to 2 ratio. Perfect fourths have a 4 to 3 ratio. And major thirds have a 5 to 4 ratio. Is there such a thing as a perfect number? The answer is yes. Today's date, 628, involves two perfect numbers. Now, the definition of a perfect number is when the proper divisors add up to exactly that number. So, for example, the proper divisors of 6 are 1, 2, and 3. Added up, we get 6. The proper divisors of 28 are 1, 2, 4, 7, and 14. Added up, we get exactly 28. Now, what if the proper factors don't add up exactly to that number? We call those abundant and deficient numbers. So abundant numbers are when the proper factors add up to more than that number, like 12 and 18. And when they don't add up to at least that number, we call them deficient numbers, like 4 and 10. Imagine that you and a group of friends want to find the average of all of your salaries without actually revealing anyone's salary. Is this possible? The answer is yes. Here's how you can do it. Each person is going to have a piece of paper and a pencil. One person is going to start by writing this incredibly large number that includes their salary. Then they're going to pass that piece of paper on to the next person. And that person is going to add their salary on top of this incredibly large number on that new piece of paper. So that means the third person will only see that new sum. They're going to keep adding their salaries on that new piece of paper until it reaches the first person. That first person is going to subtract that incredibly large number without their salary in there. And then they are going to divide by the number of people. And there you have it. Everyone can see the average salary without anyone revealing their actual salary. Disclaimer, outside of this math puzzle, I do believe that it is important to share what your salary is to make sure that you are paid fairly. What if I told you that I can pick three random cards in a standard deck and at least two of them will be the same color? That's not really that interesting. What if I told you that in a room of 367 people, at least two people will share the same birthday? That's not that interesting either. What if I told you that in a city like LA or in a smaller city like Fresno, at least two people will have the same amount of strands of hair on their head? Now that's a little more interesting. All of those were examples of what's called the pigeonhole principle, which basically states that if there are more pigeons than holes, then at least one of these holes will have more than one pigeon in them. Now here's a math puzzle, and I want you to think about how this relates to the pigeonhole principle. Think of any six integers. I guarantee you that I can choose two of those integers and subtract them, and the difference will be divisible by five. 